All right, Martez, welcome to Kinsbure Podcast. Thanks for thanks very much for doing this. Yeah, so it's my pleasure. I um, was looking forward to this, and I was when you said yes, I was like, wow, okay, this will be good. It'll be my opportunity to be able to talk about my life a little bit. You know what was nice was uh, I, I thought it was crazy that you saw a show and you thought of me. I was mm-hmm. like, and then the show is about someone doing a podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. You're going to talk a little about that. Yeah, so the, the name of the show, it's on NBC, it's called God Friended Me. Okay. And um, this guy, he, he receives these um, friend requests, and it says from God, wow. and it's for other people, and it, it turns out that these people need help. Yeah. And he's... He does a little investigating on who they are, and then he winds up running into them yeah. and helping them through a problem. Wow! And uh, you know, when I when I saw you and you told me about your podcast, that was the first thing that came to mind because uh, you've always been like that type of person wow. uh, here on campus, someone who was always thinking about someone else. Wow. Yeah. So that was, uh, you know, it, just, it was easy to put those two together. That's very kind of you to notice. Very kind of you to say that. So let's let's talk a bit about. Um, I want to run right to the beginning because okay. we got a little bit of your story, yeah. and I was so fascinated with what I heard mm-hmm. at first. So where does Martez grow up? So let's talk about just your childhood a little bit. Well, I, I grew up in Maryland, a yeah. small town called Haverty Grace. It's probably forty percent black, sixty percent white. There okay. wasn't. I think we had maybe two Chinese families wow. and uh, one Puerto Rican family, wow. <laughs> but everyone else was black and white. And right. um, you know, both my parents. Um, my dad worked. He was a, a head custodian at, at our high school. Okay. Um, my mom worked at a bank, and then in between, she would iron and you know and clean houses and things. I mean, really? they, no shame. Really. No shame. Um, that's what made me proud of my parents because wow. it didn't matter what, you know, they did what they had to do to make sure they took care of the family. You right. Know, I have, right. Um, I have uh, five brothers okay. and, and three sisters, so I come from a fairly large, large family. And okay. um, one of the things about my dad that it really just like resonates with me is that um, he always made sure to find time, you know, to hang out. Wow. You know, whether if we went fishing or if to call me in the backyard to help. Right. You know, build something because he was always building. Wow. Or even when I played football, baseball, he was always on time to come pick me up and take me to be- the baseball practice or That's crazy. football practice. And uh, and then, you know, I can't really say um, anything bad about my mom. My mom is, uh, she's a strong woman of God. She's been in the same church since 1963. She's okay. the oldest um, serving member really? in our hometown church uh, wow. back in Maryland. And, um it's just been, you know, uh, um, a beacon of service. Right. Uh, every day she would go over to the nursing home and she would sit with some of the older folks and read to them and, and feed them. Wow. And, uh, you know, every now and then I'd get a chance. So I was like the little Marty that was running around. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and making all the, the, the ladies and the men in the beds laugh. And, really? You know, and, you know, being a joy to them. So I learned a lot from them about service and uh, hard work and... Um, you know, and we and all my brothers and sisters, we always had, we all had a, a close relationship, and uh, you know, and they're all living. None, oh, that's great. none of them ever went to jail. Oh, that's, what my, hey. that's what my mom and dad always brag about. That, oh, there you, you go. Know, had all these kids, but none, none ever went to jail. You yeah. know, they're all living and doing well. So, so you know. we spoke a little bit earlier, and you mentioned service. You were saying mm-hmm. that um, within the world that. You know, like you'd like to work in service has to be someone involved, right? Yes. So, yes. what 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 role has service played for you, in just in terms of your outward outlook? Well, you know what, uh, service has led me to um, be a pastor. I'm now a, a pastor. Congratulations uh, for a church been a pastor now for five years. Wow. Um, ever since growing up, um, I was like the one who would bring home the stray dog. Or wow. Or the friend that yeah. needed a place to stay, right. uh, and my parents never turned turned them away. Um, went into the military right out of high school. Um, I just felt like I needed to do something, you mm-hmm. know, for the, for my country. Sure, uh, especially in being in a small town. I kind of wanted to get out of the town yeah. too at the same time. Yeah. Um, and then um, one thing that I, I did that I'm very proud of uh, in 2013, I donated a kidney. Uh, to one of uh, the members of our church, of uh, actually a Filipino lady, 
You know, so me being African American, her being Filipino, you know, the whole idea that this came together and we were a match. And wow. in that story, it's just one of those. It's a, it's let's, a crazy story in itself. Let's, yeah. let's hear about that. How do you well, donate a kidney? Like, what, how does that come about? Well, um, my my wife. I've been married now for seven years, and and I'll talk about that a little bit because sure. it's not my first. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I went through some things, and oh, man. Um, you know, finally found uh, my my true love. And wow. um, this couple, um, when. We started going to this church we found um, were, like, counseling us. We weren't married yet. We were living together and sure. all these things, and we just felt like we needed to find somewhere to grow. Wow. And um, so this couple volunteered their time to come and kind of talk us through and try to get us on the right track as far as love and what true love is. And, right. Um, and, you know, and working towards marriage. And... Um, Right after we got married, a year after we got married, um, the his name is Charlie. His wife is Myra. I'll just get this to have those names. Sure. And uh, Myra approached my wife and was saying that you know due to diabetes, uh, my kidney is my kidneys are failing, and I'm going to need to go on dialysis. But it's so severe that if I don't get a donor, uh, I'm going to die. And my wife, she kept it to herself for a while because. She was thinking that she was going to be the one to donate her kidney. And so one day she told me, um, you know, God spoke to me and uh, and I, he said, give your kidney to Myra. And I was like, whoa, that's that's deep because <laughs> that is deep. You, you're, you're afraid of needles, you know, so let alone you going to go in to a hospital and let them cut you open and take a kidney. I said, you know, you are becoming my hero right now. And... Um, but I said, you know what I'll do? I said, if you if you decide that this is what you want to do and you get tested, then I'll get tested and see if I can also, maybe we can donate together to someone. You know, I just wanted to be supportive uh, of my wife. And That's she, a crazy amount of yeah. support. Eh? <laughs> it <did sound> like <laughs> that. But it just, I felt like that was, you know, she needed, you know, to hear something like that. That's beautiful. And then... Um, she got tested, and she found out that she was a match. Hmm. And um, I remember what I had said, and I was like, okay, now it's my turn. But then as I was getting ready to go get tested, um, and I believe God speaks to us all, he, he, I heard his voice plainly say, um, you're going to be the one who's going to replace your wife. And I was like, okay, God, listen, you know, she's Filipino, and I'm sure. black. I know you're a miracle worker, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he said, just go get tested. So I went and got tested. And this is after they're already celebrating because, you know, my wife's a match. And she already let her know. And they're, like, already planning when this can happen. And um, I went, and then I received my letter in the mail. And it said that I was a match. And when I, we compared, it, I was actually a better match. Uh, to this woman than my wife was. And, you know, because of where I work and the type of vacation I have, uh, my wife is self-employed. Um, I told her, I said, this, this is me. This is um, all, everything is pointing that, that I'm supposed to be the one who go through this. That's crazy, man. I'm, I, you know, it reminds me of uh, that verse: "Better love hath no man than to give his life for his brother." Right. Right. right so right. when 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 you're looking at this, is is it something scary? Because I I think is this is a little bit of this in protection of your wife. Is what what's the what's the intention behind it? Right. The first, if the beginning was protection of my wife because I already know how she is around needles and all those kind of things, um, and then. I just had this feeling of, uh, how would I put it, um, just confidence mm -hmm. that um, this was actually God speaking. He was telling me that this is what he wants me to do. And every test that I went through came back flawless. You wow. know, um, they do this intelligence test where they actually just, it's like you go through psych and you go through all the blood work and all these things. And on the psych test, they ask you, uh, about 10 questions and then um, they scramble you and then they uh, ask you to repeat those questions back and it just pop, 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 
bah, 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 just flew one after another. And the doctor just sat back in his chair and was like, I have this physicians and doctors that could not, could not do what you did. And it's not, it's not my intelligence. I'm just telling you, it was like this was going to happen right. um, because I committed to it. Right. And I truly believe the guy was saying, I told you, you know. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's talk about it like, like this. So let me, let me ask you that in an inverted sense. So I haven't necessarily parsed my audience to find out who's of what belief, but right. the idea, there's a universality, right, right. to the idea that God has spoken to you. Mm -hmm. The universality right. is, of course, whatever it is that you you, you adhere to, or right. whatever you feel it controls your life, whether it be the universe, right. whether you're you know monotheistic, polytheistic. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what? How would you define that speaking? Is it confidence? Is it certainty? Certainty? Is it just knowing without a shadow of a doubt? It is. It's like knowing without a shadow of a doubt. You you. Um, it's like your conscious is talking to you. Wow. So and you and so you're com having a conversation in your head. More or less, but it's um, but it's beyond just in your head. Right, right. <laughs> if that makes any sense, it makes uh, a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, you know whether what whatever you believe, I believe um, you know we we all come from one Creator. Right, and um, and so there's bits and pieces of Him in all of us, and I, I believe He speaks to through to all of us at some point, you know, in right. our life, no matter what what we believe or how we believe it. Um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've learned in some of the studying that I've done is that um, no matter if you have different opinions or different thoughts or follow, every which way you follow, um, there's two things that, that God has put into us that um, that keep, brings us together, and that's that's love, love mm -hmm. in our hearts. Mm -hmm. it, that's one place we can all come together. So we can all love something the same. Mm -hmm. No matter how who what kind of belief that we have, right? You know, uh, you know, a, a puppy. Just you know, throwing something out there, a puppy. You know, I can love that a puppy the same way a Muslim can love him, and a Hindu can love him, and a Buddhist can love him, because we have that. Or even our, our wives, or our, or or our brother, or our sister. Right. We, you know, that is in us. Uh, you, you know, you know what that reminds me of is. Uh, have you seen that movie Interstellar? Yes, yes. So what's so profound about that movie and is the fact that the first time I saw it, I got the grand scheme of love mm -hmm. can transcend event horizon, yes. right? It can transcend you going through a black hole. Yeah. But what's more is, you know, in the last year, I've been hearing a lot about um, time is relative within the sense of how fast you're moving. So mm -hmm. if you were to shoot into space and move extremely fast, you age slower than mm -hmm. someone who's on Earth. Right. So the thing that was so perplexing to me was the idea of love is even without bounds in terms of speed and age, right? right? Yeah. So it's, so it's something that I think we all can feel. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you something a little deeper, though. Okay. Do you think that that love is based on your perception of the self? No. Um, that, that's a good question. Because, um, you know... When the baby, say when a baby is born, you know, you instantly love that child. You haven't even got the chance to know him yet. Right. You know, it's just, and they love you back, and you can feel it when they cuddle up into you, and just, you know, um, it's already in us. Um, it just there's certain triggers I think that bring it out. You sure. Know, certain, you know, circumstances that happen in our lives. Right. But it's there. Right. It's 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 our being. It is eternal. Wow. Yeah. There's a Randy Newman song I was listening to. I've been obsessed with Randy Newman yeah. for a few days now. <laughs> There's a song I was listening to called Marie. It's on an album that's a little bit mm -hmm. crazy. Good old boys. Right. 74, I think. Mm -hmm. And the song is... So Randy Newman writes in character, right? right. So he'll be... So, so for the, song, the Marie song, right. he was an alcoholic who got home drunk after drinking with his friends and stood looking at his wife laying in bed. And the song has two sides to it, right? So the one side is he's looking at his wife and he keeps saying, I've loved you from the moment I saw you. Mm -hmm. But on the other side is him acknowledging that he beats her from time to time. But then on the other side is right. him acknowledging that, you know, she wears her hair. He remembers the first time he saw her, she was wearing her hair in this right. way. And I, I just found that that balance is so interesting. Of course, it's, cont right. it's full of con contempt, right? right? But when you... 
knew, did you know when you saw your wife that she was your first love? Did you? No, it didn't happen to me that way. Really? No. How did it happen, if you don't mind me? Um, <laughs> it's funny because um, the first time I saw my wife, I saw her from behind. <laughs> <laughs> and that little, that little booty was just like <laughs> it caught my attention oh fantastic <laughs> okay so, <laughs> so yeah. you know I, I'm sure there the men out there that can relate hey, to that <laughs> listen we're, we're all in there yeah, so, yeah. but yeah that's that's first time I saw her that's how I saw her she, right. her back was actually to me and I was like wow Wow. Yeah, I got to know who this is. So you, you, you yeah. went and got her attention? Or? Yeah, got her attention. Um, she, my wife, Filipino. Okay. And um, I, I um, through music, I actually spent some time in the Philippines, and I learned a, a Filipino song. And, uh, you know, I was so happy, like, ready. Yeah. That when I meet a Filipino woman, I'm going to hey, sing this song. Smooth operator. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. You know, it, yeah, she sat down and said, you know, I know this song. You know, we talked a little bit. I said, sure. I know this song in Tagalog. She's like, yeah, well, you know. So I started singing a little bit of it. Yeah. And she was like, oh, so right there. <laughs> <laughs> that right. was the beginning. <laughs> that was for all the viewers take tips. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, here's the thing. So let's jump a little bit. Right. So there's a couple of gold records back here. Yeah. Is that one... So that's that's platinum from this Australia. This is platinum, yes. This is gold. That's here. gold album in Japan. Okay. Gold single in uh, in here in the U.S. Wow. One hundred thousand copies. Man, yeah. congratulations. Yeah. Let's 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 go to this chapter if you don't okay. mind. Okay. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah. So, uh, M Marty. Yeah. This was your stage name. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's where I grew up. Really? Yes. Yeah. Martez is my workman name, but yeah, I yeah. grew up as Marty. That's that's who I am. So when when did music become a thing? Was it after you left the army? Um, that's when it, I started to realize the dream. But uh, prior to that, uh, I was a Jackson Five fan from the yeah, beginning. And, really. And talent shows with my younger brother and my niece. We used to do all the little the moves and right. And um, in high school, I was a b boy. Wow. So I'm a I'm a product of the eighties. Right. You know, right, so right. I actually was in the beginning when breakdancing was, was starting. Sure. You know, one of the first ones to be able to do a windmill. Oh, you know, there so. you go. There you go. So so yeah. what what is it about the military that seems to foment a lot of good musicians? I, I listen to Chet Baker a lot, yeah. the military, right. Jimmy, military, you as yeah. well. What right. what is it about? You know what? It's not that the military does it, it's that uh some of us found that the military was a way out. When I was when I uh, went to my first um, school, I was in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. I met this guy. His name was Harry L. And his voice was baby face times three. Really? Could, I mean, and then I just kept meeting musicians and singers. And we used to go to the rec center. And you can rent equipment. And, you you know, we used to make right. little songs and stuff. And... It's um. It's not that the military is developing. It's sure. that these people um, already have this talent, sure. but it just turns out that um, you know they're from small towns or just right. don't necessarily know where they're going to go in, in their life. And they, you know, they say, "Okay, military will get me out in the world." Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't planning on singing in, in the military, um, but. I wound up meeting a whole lot of people who love to sing. Right. And that was just, it was just wonderful. And I, I, you'll probably hear the same story from others if you interviewed, you know, others who were, came I'm, out of the military. I think that's so profound that you made that point because I'm sure it's not just me, man, that's curious about that. Right. Because it's like, how many people do we all know who we've heard of, who we listen to on a daily basis, who are in the military, and then you find out that maybe the military is a way to get out. That's mm -hmm. so profound. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it was definitely a way to get out of the, a town and to serve. Yeah. So I, I have to ask you then. Um, I, I, I did my master's, my first master's I did mm -hmm. in New York. Right. And one of my classmates, very, very bright guy, uh, after we finished our master's, he joined the military. And he mm -hmm. was an African-American chap right. as well. Right. Um, what is, is it something, is, is there a higher prevalence of people of color going into the military or is that one way that people of color see that they could see the world 
or is it a way that people of color see they can serve? Or what is it exactly? I think it's a combination of all of those things. Um, you know, coming out of from Vietnam War, I remember talking to our um, older um, vice president for student affairs, okay, uh, Doug Robinson. Okay, he was one who uh, came out of Vietnam, and that he was told, you know. Um, well, actually, before going, I'm going to take go back. Sure, I, sure. Coming out of high school, okay. he was told that the only option he had was the Army. Because oh. um, being African-American, especially, he grew up, um, you know, in the 50s and 60s. Sure. Um, so he wound up going to Vietnam. When he came back, he had his GI Bill, but oh, he was man. still being told, this is in the 70s now, that um, black people don't go to school, you know, uh, you should re-enlist, you should stay in the military because you have a career. And he was like, uh, I'm getting out, and he went, he wanted to go into college and become, you know, getting his PhD sure. and being our vice president of student affairs here at Cal State Long Beach. Um, but um, that is something that counselors. M- I, I was pretty smart in school. I was in the higher echelon classes in my in, in high school, right. but I never had a counselor talk to me about college. Hmm. And this was in the 80s. Hmm. I, I read somewhere something disturbing that, um, well, it was it was an assessment that was made by Malcolm mm-hmm. Gladwell, the author, who found, and I think it was Revisionist History, maybe mm-hmm. his podcast, right. he found that one of the greatest determinants of whether or not a student, for example, goes into an Ivy League school is having a teacher that looks like them. Yeah. I found that yeah. to be pretty profound. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely very relevant. You know, even in jobs that we take or places that we go, the military was easy. I won't say easy. It was uh, a place where it was definitely familiar. We sure. lot of a lot of African Americans, a lot of black people in right, right. the military, right. and even for the his, uh, for like for the Hispanics as well. There was a lot uh, in the military, hmm. um, and. You know, you go where sometimes where you know that you're going to be accepted. Yeah, and um, you know, one of the crazy things that about the military, there were a lot of white people that I met that had never seen a black person before. What? Yeah. Wow. And a lot of these Midwestern places, little small towns. Right. Yeah, they just like, you know, it was a, it was a trip to be a basic training with someone who is fascinated, just kind of staring at you because they'd never seen a black person in person. Yeah, that that must have been an experience, yeah. eh? Yeah, but they turned out to be some of the coolest guys right, right. because they weren't corrupted or had yeah. this thoughts already preconceived, you know, thoughts of what black people were like before coming. I, I lived in Idaho before here, mm-hmm. and I lived in a town of 50,000 people, and I noticed some people who were from smaller towns like uh, the Burleys, the Jeromes, mm-hmm. like really small towns in mm-hmm. Idaho who had never really interacted with black people. Mm-hmm. There were some of the... Um, easiest, not easiest, but some of the least difficult people to disarm yeah, yeah. based on like these notions that they had had of black people right. before interacting right. with a black person. Right. You know? So it seemed like it was usually a pleasant experience yeah. after you know, like one time someone said something pretty contentious, contemptuous and it was tough to hear, but when I walked him off and just, you know, and I was younger right. I just talked to him, I was like, hey look, you, this is why it hurts people for you to say this Never said it again. Yeah, he understood it. Yeah, Got it. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so let let let's go back to yeah. here. So, in the military, I'm assuming that this doesn't come without figuring out some of the grind. Right. Yeah. So I I wound up going to Desert Storm, and wow. when I came back, I had a choice to go to Hawaii or to Washington D.C. Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Wow. Uh, growing up in Maryland, I wanted to come back close to home. Sure. And. Um, at, over the time, I'd build up my little studio. I had keyboards and drum machines and microphones and all this stuff. And I had a little apartment in Silver Spring and wow. started just making my own stuff. And I remember going to my uh, fifth year uh, high school reunion. Was it fifth? Five? Yeah, five, five, fifth year. And um, I pulled my buddy up in the car and I had a cassette, you know, and popped it in. Yeah. and. He started listening to it. He was like, "Oh man, we could do something." And I was like, "Okay, all right. yeah." Because we were we were a break dance group before, right, and we all right, we right. always do up and we always you know rap. We did everything. Right. It's just you know when I went away, it kind of 
separated. But now that I'm back close to home, we started calling up the guys. And then they started coming up to my apartment and we started recording. And when we thought that we had something, we had a friend in New York. He ran um, a, uh, I don't know, remember the, the disc jockey yes. club, uh, pools? Yeah, yeah, And he, yeah, had, yeah. he had the magazines and, and the, What's the, the record pool. pool? In, in, in case, in case. Yeah. So, and in, in that time, there, you had record pools. So these, are, he was the type of guy who would be able to get the latest record before anybody else would get it, and he would um, uh, DJs from all over could either subscribe through like a magazine. Wow. Yeah. So they could just subscribe through the magazine and have records come to them as soon as they come out. Sure. And or he also would go to. Um, club you know on behalf of record companies he would right. go to djs in some of these clubs right. and get them to play the record so that, right. that it gets out you know within the city so so he had some connections and um we we came up with a cassette and he took us right into atlantic records right and walked right into the door sheesh yeah and um he said listen i know you guys got this tape i've heard it he said i don't want you to play the tape he said, you know all that stuff, doo-wop stuff you guys used to do when you were, uh, you know, breakdancing? Do you guys remember any of that? And we're like, yeah, we still do. I think we could do it. So we went in and we started singing a cappella. In Atlantic? Yeah. Wow. And the guy was blown away. And he's like, listen, I'm going to send you guys down to Philly. Um, and we're going to make a demo. Wow. And uh, the guys he, he connected us with was, um, was it Bobby Eli... And I can't remember the other guy, but these were writers for like Blue Magic and wow. some of the old school. Sure. And it was crazy because we went into a studio that was like old school. Wow. I mean, it had like the old organs and all wow. kinds of stuff. Crazy, yeah. And the record that we cut, it sounded old school. It was not going to make it. Really? Yeah. It just, he put us with the wrong team. You know, uh. he they had a sound. That was, you know, that Blue Magic stylistic sure, sure. sound. This is already the '90s, mm. the early '90s, right. and um, it just the two didn't match. So there wasn't nostalgia for the sound yet. No, really, no, not yet. So what what do you do? Well, we figured out now that um, we can drop the tape and all that stuff. The stuff we were doing was kind of like dance music. Sure. Yeah, and um, and we started doing hip hop and started writing I'm not hip hop but um, yeah. acapella music and started writing um, songs like you know with Boys to Men and Color Me Bad and all those Whoa. and how do you connect with Boys to Men because at that time they were on top of the world yeah so um, we actually just we didn't never we never got a chance to perform with Boys to Men uh, or even meet them okay but they were an inspiration to to our music and, and to us even just growing. Okay. Um, it took us two years of grinding um, in order to get back in front of another record company. Seriously? I mean, one, we we, we sing in, the, when we go to New York, we would actually sing in, in Central Station. Wow, whoa. We would stop the, you know, the whole yeah, area, yeah, everyone yeah. just circle around and we're, we're singing songs like Daddy's Home and then oh, wow. the Still in the Night and all these things. And, oh, wow. you know, and then we'd throw some of our originals in there and we would have a crowd and even the police would stand and watch wow. and tell us, okay, I, you guys are awesome, so I'm not going to, like, make you leave right now, yeah. but <laughs> you don't have a permit, so we're going to move you along, you know, but get a couple more in real sure, quick. Sure. <laughs> kind of a thing. That's and, good. you know, we were making like $200 in, uh, in like a half an hour. In half an hour. Yeah, because these businessmen were coming off the train and they were hearing songs from their day, you know, the in the still of the nights and under the boardwalk and all this stuff, and they were just like, and just putting in. <laughs> you know, I, I want to stop us there for the sake of yeah. the educational portion of all this, is I would call that proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Do you think of it the same way? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so let's go on. Yeah, so um, we... we we're trying to, we found a manager, we had some producers, and we spent as much time in New York as we could because if you were going to be seen, yeah. it wasn't going to be in Haverty Grace, Maryland, or Baltimore. It was going to be in New York. Right, right. And um, we, the guy that we, we uh, hired as our manager, he actually set up a party um, where he invited uh, Eddie O'Loughlin, who was the president of Next Plateau Records, who wow. had... You know, Salt and Pepper oh, and Paperboy, wow. uh, you know, at that time. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
we came, we went to Macy's, and we got some suits from yeah. the money we made at the train station. <laughs> oh, there you go, yeah. And we came to the party, and we sang a cappella, and he was like, you know what? You guys just need a song. Um, and, you know, at first we kind of felt a little discouraged. He said, uh, but he said, go home, and uh, I'm going to call you. And we were like, okay. So about a week later, he actually called you, called Whoa. us. Um, and he said, um, I have a song for you. I want you to, to see what you can do with this song, Sukiyaki. And I was like, we were like, okay, Sukiyaki. Uh, you know, Taste of Honey. Yeah. It was the original. Right, 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 right. Who did it. Right. And um, so we, we put together our own uh, acapella rendition of it. And then we called him back on the phone and we sang it over the phone. He said, all right, get on the train and come up to New York. And um, then he, he um, put us in the studio to actually do it the exact same way that we did a cappella. He just put a little bit of music to it wow. and so on. And um, this was um, just to kind of put a timeline on things. Sure. Uh, my last day in the military was uh, May 10th, 1994. Okay. I decided I was going, not going to re-enlist. I was going to pursue this and make this something, make this happen. And... Um, July of 1994, I was signing on the dotted line for a record deal. Wait a minute. Yeah. This is hardly two months later. Yeah. Because though I was in the military in Washington, D.C., every weekend we were in New York. I see. And this was, and it was just grind, 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 sleeping wherever we could on the floors. Uh, our, our, one of my, the guys in the group, his cousin, lived right across from Yankee, the old Yankee Stadium. Yeah, yeah. And I was, just will not forget laying on his floor and waking up and seeing a roach that was probably like four <laughs> inches. <laughs> I saw the shadow before I saw the roach. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> you know, that was the kind of things that we went through, yeah. you know, to make this happen. But it was all about just being persistent. Yeah. And grinding and grinding and staying in where it was happening right. as much as possible. I mean, I think there's a brilliance to that. I like that you added the next part because you always hear about the persistence bit, mm -hmm. but you never hear about the be where it's relevant. Right. You know? You have to be. Yeah. And it, it's funny how I've met people who like to just stay where they are and think that it's going to come to them. Right, right, right. You know, I'll just dig here, you know. Yeah. And, Maybe somebody might fly in, stay at a hotel, and yeah. one day decide I'm gonna go to this little club, and you get recognized. That's probably one in every one billion, you know. But if you're where it's actually happening, and you make yourself available to be wherever you hear that someone else is gonna be, you, you know, be you there. go there, and you never know if you might get the opportunity. You say, hey, you know, we sing, or we we're always together. It's four of us. We look like a group, right? So people right. would always say, y'all guys look like a group. Wow. You know, sing something. Yeah, yeah. And then because we could sing a cappella, we were able to like, bam, wow. and it would just blow them away. You guys don't sign yet, no record. You know, those. I mean, those were the kind of reactions that we we had, but we just couldn't go on that reaction. Hmm. We, you know, we knew that we were good, but the right people didn't know yet. There's such wisdom there. <laughs> There's such wisdom there. The hmm. right people didn't know yet. Yeah. So the day you're signing the deal, how does that feel? What is it like? What's the day like? It was awesome. You know, I went to this this, this uh, pen shop in New York and got me a. <laughs> I went and got me a Mont Blanc. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I only mean, had like a hundred and some dollars in my pocket. I spent sure. the whole thing on a Mont Blanc. On, on a Mont Blanc That's a nice pen, just though. so that I could have it to sign. Sure, sure. Yeah, I got the the fountain pen too. Oh uh, yeah. man, yeah. <laughs> Just for that, it was it was awesome. But did all four in the group sign? Or was yeah, we just... all signed. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. So from yeah. from that point, is it just a whirlwind? It was. Um, so first of all, you know, the name of the group was Four PM okay. for Positive Music. Okay. Yeah, and um, the song that we're talking about is Sukiyaki. Sukiyaki. Yeah. yeah. Um, we um, we had to get in, and we got that single um, done, and by August we were already in the top one hundred. As a single, um, the crazy thing is that it was always it was playing all the way on the West Coast. Wow. San Francisco was the first one to break our record, and then Kiss here in L.A. Yeah, yeah, uh, went from there. Yeah, and um, but New York wasn't playing our record. It was crazy, and then um, by September we were in the top fifty. Wow, 
Um, and the October came around. Well, we shot our video, our music video. We sure. shot it in Chinatown. Wow. Uh, and, and like people like Matt Dillon showed up. It, you know, because it was like near his neighborhood. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. so yeah, they were like yeah. coming, hanging out wow. and stuff. It was crazy. And um, then by December, we topped. We didn't hit number one. We um, we went top number eight was the highest that we went on the Hot 100. Okay, okay. Um, but we went gold and platinum. Wow. And um, the song Sukiyaki is actually a remake of a Japanese song, even though the lyrics don't translate. Wow. The, the Japanese song was a song uh, uh, by an artist named Ku Sakamoto in 1963. And the history of that is that it was the first song in a foreign language to ever go number one in the American chart. Sheesh. Yeah, just from that melody alone. That melody alone had, you know, people you know, just loving it here in America. So uh, he uh, died in a, pain, a plane crash in 1995. Uh, okay. And um, by the time the song hit big in J in Japan, or was leading up, it was leading up to the anniversary. So, '94, you know, is when we released and it started chart. Going into '95, um, it was running to that anniversary. So Japan reached out to us. They wanted us. To, we started going over to Japan and had us on every TV show you can think of. We met Ku Sakamoto's wife, his, wow. his daughter. You know, both the actresses. Um, I have a bottle of their wine from their vintage, oh, you know, from wow. their, yeah, I was looking yeah, at that. Wow, that's yeah you know, from their own vineyard and, um, you know, it's, uh, sukiyaki turns out to be a food. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I get it when I go to Shabu Shabu, I, really? I buy sukiyaki, I get sukiyaki. You, you know, what's crazy that you say that I actually got chills. Um, my new collection, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff in there that's Japanese influence, mm -hmm. and there's a story behind that. Because when I started designing, all the designers I looked up to were all Japanese. Right. And what I like is America has this relationship with efficiency and capitalism. Mm -hmm. So you make something great, you can forget about it because the new one's going to be cheaper, right? And it's just going to be better to make, right? I like the the fact that you know when we got rid of our looms here, the denim looms, mm -hmm. because production stopped in the states, mostly in Okinawa all the looms were bought there and now the Japanese are making the best denim in the right, world. Right. So when I did my first trade show, the first stores I opened were in Japan. And I oh, felt like cool. that was, yeah, I felt like that was the biggest honor. And so it's it's crazy because the more I go down this path of design, mm -hmm. the more I see um, the imagery, the aesthetic, the careful consideration of quality because right. they had um, the quality guy went there and you know, what right. was his name by the way? Forgotten, but anyway, so I, I find that to be so fascinating too that it was yeah. Japan, so yeah. everything was open to you guys, yeah, today. yeah, it, that opened the door, um, to really start to see the world. And that was, you know, I, I went in the military thinking that was going to take me around the world, but it was actually the music business that that did so. Do you, do you did you feel at that point that the goals that you had had or the plans that you had had for your life were superseded by something you didn't expect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I always felt like I was going to do something great, you know, um, but not on a scale to where it would be, you know, I would have people from all over the world knowing my name, wow. anything anything like that. Um, I, I never thought of myself as something that, someone that would just be stuck in my in my town, mm -hmm. um, and you know, this it opened up an opportunity for me to really just. Um, I get to know culture. That was probably the my biggest takeaway from all of it was um, experiencing all the different cultures and falling in love with how you know, like the Japanese, how respectful they are and how yeah. hardworking they are. Or when I would go to um, you know, like Indonesia or Malaysia, and um, you know, understand um, you know how the the people their how their daily lives are yeah. and what they go through, and then even be, experience some of the some of the most poorest areas in the world, uh, and heart just ready to just fall out and mm -hmm. with compassion, and trying to figure out what can I do uh, to help. You know, a lot of what I saw has really shaped who I am today, and why I want to serve. So that uh, plays into the service. Uh, yeah, us. yeah, yeah. So, so um, one would expect that after charting. 
and after mm-hmm. having this global experience, how do you transition out of it? Because now we're at Cal State Long Beach. Yeah. I know you in this yeah. world. Yeah. You know, when you yeah. told me that story, I was blown I, away. Seeing the records, <laughs> I'm blown away. So how yeah. does that happen? If you don't mind me asking. Well, you know what? Um, I I know off off. Um, I would say off camera, um, but off script, we were talking before about um, how um, was what I was just thinking of. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. It's okay. It was. Uh, uh, let me see if I can remind you. It was the transition for leaving, and uh, let's see, service, leaving. I'm trying to think too. Well, you know, let, let's just go back to your your question. Sure, you know. sure. Um, we were as a group, we were, we were doing well, but and now I'm getting the thought back. Oh, we're okay. talking about yeah, how you have to try to put things in place properly in the beginning. Sure. Uh, or you start playing catch up after that. Okay. Um, we didn't really have the money. Everything happened so fast. We didn't really have the money for a good lawyer. Um, actually, the funny thing is that Elijah Cummings. Yeah. Uh, the representative. Yeah. Okay. His office in Baltimore, um, they were our representation. Really? Uh, because of a friend. But he's wow. not a, they're not entertainment. Sure, sure. So, you know, they did the best that they could. But when it turned out to see every, everything come through, our contract wasn't really in our favor. Wow. Yeah. It may have looked like it to us, but it sure definitely wasn't in our favor. So, so people were taking off the top. Yeah. So there was money was going everywhere but in our pockets. Yeah. Everywhere but in our pockets. So, you know, we got to travel first class, eat first class, sleep first class. But that was all money that was coming back out. Um, and then when the record sold, um, you know, we weren't really seeing anything from that. So it became what I call an expensive hobby after a while. And I had to make a change because, um, you know, I talked earlier about uh, multiple marriages. Yeah. You know, the red company, well, I, I can't put any blame on anything but myself. But because of my desires and my, my goals, I didn't really include my family in those. And, you know, so um, my wife and my, fir- my first wife and my three uh, daughters, you know, we, we wound up splitting. And... Um, you know, and I continued to try to chase after it. And my, at that point, my motivation was, um, now I have to do everything I can to make sure I take care of my children, um, because I can't leave them like that. I've already left them, but I can't leave them struggling and fighting to to, to eat and have clothes. And you know, what doesn't make sense that their dad is has a record, mm-hmm. gold records on his wall, but they're struggling. Uh, so that became part of our, my motivation to really try to do something. So we did a second album, and it didn't it, it didn't work. And um, I decided, you know what, fellas, I I have to I have to do something else. And um, I left the group. And it must have been tough. It, it was tough. We it, you know the way it was crazy because we actually went to Japan. We did this final. Well, they didn't know it was going to be a final show. I told them. Ahead of time, listen, guys, this is going to be my final show. Uh, and I even brought, like, a bottle of Dom Perignon, <laughs> you know, thinking that they would celebrate it. Because, you know, I saw the writing on the wall, but I guess they didn't really see it. Mm. That, um, And I was the one who gave up the most. I had a military career. I had things. It was my car that drove up and down to New York. Every, sure, sure. You know, it was, uh, you know, it, I felt like I just was losing. Everything was just falling out falling apart and um so that was my last one i i had to do something i so i i that was that that show was it and when i came back i was trying to figure out okay why haven't i gotten paid yet for that show and it turns out that um they redirected the money that was supposed to come to me to themselves Mm. and that kind of really i said you know really caught me off guard because we've been brothers for since we were teenagers and all of a sudden, this happens, and it's like they're gonna. I did the show. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do any more. But now you're gonna take the money from me. What did that do to the relationship moving forward? It um, it fractured it to a degree. I went. I was uh, living out here in California, and um, at this time, I already had met someone else, and I remarried. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 
And um, so I went back to Maryland and I talked to the guys and I was like, you know, this is not how you, you know, you treat your brother. Mm-hmm. And, and two of them, they agreed and they actually gave me the money back. He said, I knew, I told Bob, you know, Bob, Bob he's the older, yeah, the yeah. one in the group. And he was the one who was hurt the most. And uh, so when I went to Bobby's house, he's, uh, he's like, uh, nah, man, I'm keeping it. He said, if you want it, you can, you can try to take it. So he was, like, really getting like that. And I was like, oh, man, listen, man, I'm, we're, we're brothers, man. I'm not, it's not even, I wouldn't even try to approach it that way. I was just hoping that out of your heart that you would be willing, like the others, to give, you know, give my portion back. So. Yeah. At, at this point, are you, are you a person who's a, a believer? You're entrenched in your faith. I am kind of on the f- both, kind of hot and warm, or hot okay. and cold, okay. what you want to call it. Um, um, so definitely I never stopped loving those guys and stopped loving Bobby. Mm-hmm. And, and I showed definitely a whole lot of uh, patience and... Uh, and really, I, I thought about what he must be feeling. Hmm. You know, I, I'm, he must feel that I betrayed them by leaving. Because um, maybe he's not seeing us at the same point that I see as that. And um, so when I took a step back and realized that, I said, that's fine. And I forgive you. You know, you're my brother, so I love you. And, um, you know, it was kind of weird the trust area, but um, every time I would go home to visit, I always made sure I went to go see Bobby and we'd hang out hmm. and never mention anything about any money, you know, and uh, if it was going to tear at anybody, it wasn't going to tear at me anymore because I already released it, <laughs> you know? That takes a lot of strength to forgive, yeah. especially when it's based off of something like money. Yeah. It, it didn't mean, mean that much to me. Um, you know, my life, I've gone all the way down to, you know, in this this grind, and, and I, I didn't talk about it much, but uh, in between the two albums, I wound up living in one of my in my friend's basement. I actually remember waking up and seeing the red, the yellow lights outside where they repossessed my car, um, and I just laid back down and started thinking about, okay, what is my next steps? So, in in that moment the world feels like it's the reason why I ask the question about your faith is mm-hmm. in that moment if you're someone of a belief system mm-hmm. you feel like you've been abandoned you feel like everything's just gone you know so what how did you find like you know you know meaning for some reason um i never really had that feeling like i've that i've been abandoned um i've always been someone who's bounced back and um, so I had this confidence that the same way that we got a record deal, um, that I was going the next I was going to be able to bounce back from this and make it in something else. I wow. wasn't sure what that was yet, but I was going to be able to make it in something else. Um, my children were a, a big part of that because sure. I also wanted them. You know, I had to let the car be, be repossessed so that I could make sure that they had the things that they needed. I had to put them before myself. Uh, so if it was a car payment and them, well, okay, you guys, I don't have any gigs. I don't have anything going on. Uh, but the money I do have is coming to you. Mm. And I'm sorry, you know, General Motors, but <laughs> you have to come. You can come get this car. I knew they were going to come and get it so one day. <laughs> must, I just knew it. <laughs> you, you must be a nice person to say I'm sorry to General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I think we all want to make sure that we... You know, fulfill our, our obligations. So, sure, sure. You know, so it was it was hurtful to have to to know that I was going through that. But uh, and I didn't. My parents lived in the same town, and they would have helped me. But I didn't want to drag them through through that because uh, they had so much you know, um, you know high hopes for me. I got, like I said, I, I did well in school, and um, I was the I don't know the one that they saw doing something. So if I had to ask you if there was uh, one quote that maybe has been with you in the high times or preferably been with you in the low times one quote one verse it can be whatever it was it's philippians 121 to live is christ to die is gain um and and i why i say that is that um 
because where, where, where I live now, I try to live my life how Christ would live it. Um, and because I believe that I'm going to heaven when I die, to die is even to gain even more. So, you know, this world um, is going to perish. You know, everything are in it. You know, it's it, we we die. You know, the uh, the car that we drive now is eventually is not going to be able to be driven anymore. And the mm. clothes we wear are going to get raggedy. They're not going to... All these things come and they go. Um, but I, I hold on to that. Um, that I, I I believe that, you know, I, am, I have a place already ready for me there. So... Um, while I'm here, let me live as Christ lived. Let me try to be uh, a person who is compassionate and, and has empathy and love and doesn't judge and is caring and uh, wants to uh, and you know give wisdom where wisdom is needed and um, just be a good example. And what is even better than that is in heaven, the way it's described, um, that's even more of a game because now I don't have to worry about sickness or... You know, yeah. or you know, my health, or age, or any of those things. You know, it's so that is that's been my my verse, and I and I took that on um, the moment that I decided that I was going to give my kidney, because I never knew if you never know. You know, you go into, un, into surgery, what is it gonna, what's going to happen? You know, I could go right there on the table. So um, that just really that that one resonated in my heart that. Why I live? Let me live the best life that I can, and if I die, there's so much more to gain uh, in death through the way, through how I believe. So you must have. It seems like a common theme here is you've always been comfortable with change. Yeah, yeah. How did that just happen? <laughs> is this the way that you were, or I think it's just the way that I grew up. Um, and it's not like I changed schools or I changed homes. I was always. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, but I think through the military, um, just through, um, I don't know, life in general, you know, uh, I, I, one of the bad things is I changed wives like I was changing tires. <laughs> I've been married. <laughs> I've been married four times, and it's crazy because when people um, meet me, um, I seem like the choir boy. But you know, but I had I had issues with women, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. and it was um, and it was more of me just not being able to be faithful, mm. um, and that was that was a problem that I dealt with because mm. most of the times the person I was with didn't even know that it was happening, mm. but the guilt was so heavy in my heart that I I couldn't deal with it and I wound up sabotaging the relationship. Yeah, um, but yeah, but going back just to the change. Um, I guess I'm just not afraid of it. I've never been afraid of, afraid of change. Hmm. I've never been afraid. No. You know, it's it's beautiful that this the uh, what you're saying ended on the kidney. By the way, that mm -hmm. was such a beautiful story arc that it mm -hmm. ended right there. We're we're reaching the end of our interview, yeah. unfortunately, but I just wanted you to give an opportunity to shout out whatever you want to shout out to talk about anything you want to talk about if you have a book coming out <laughs> if there's another album if there's another single no you know um, um, my wife she's a dentist she has a practice in Lakewood uh, and she'll be celebrating her 10 year um, anniversary on October Congratulations. and we're bringing out the boys so 4pm is going to be together again really? it's going to be October 5th um, we're not sure on the time yet. It'll either be from one to six or two to eight, one of those kind of things. But right. but we're gonna perform and uh, you know do some of our at, old songs at, at her dental at place. her dental place. So uh, let me let me get the information. Yeah. Let me slap something together. Let me yeah. blast it out through our social media okay. channels. I think there's gonna be people. Yeah, it'll be it'll that. be fun. It'll be a good time. We we it's did beautiful. it for her open house ten years ago. Yeah. And so this will be the first time that we actually are singing together again after. You know, almost ten years. So, you, you know, talk about perfect timing. This is—it's just crazy. Thank you for involving me in all mm -hmm. this. Really, oh. I feel—I <laughs> feel so honored that like I got because this is the first time since then. Yeah. Wow. I think on that I have to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm glad you opened that up for opportunity because I was thinking to myself, okay, what do I talk about? But yeah, oh, that's right there. Fantastic, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Martez, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.
Yeah, yeah. It was, it's been my pleasure. I mean, this is this is awesome. I love what you're doing, uh, and I love the, the the theme. What is how do you say it in Japanese? Kintsukuroi. Again? Kintsukuroi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, that's that's awesome. And what it so. what it means of breaking and, and bringing put it back together with with gold in the seams. I, I have to tell you, that is it's beautiful. beautiful. There, there's a there was the, one of the hardest years of my life was 2015. Right. The, uh, ironically, I was watching this interview. It was something that happened in the family. I was watching a Chris Martin interview, the lead singer mm-hmm. of Coldplay. And if you've ever seen his interviews, like, I love Coldplay. They were, mm-hmm. they were actually yeah. the album I listened to on the plane flying over to the United States. Ah. So that was, I would heard some songs before on TV. Right. And then while I was flying here, I remember really getting into it. So right. I just kept playing that album on repeat. Right. So they've kind of been a footnote to my life for so many years. So um, I'm listening to him give this interview, and he just separated from his wife, Gwyneth Paltrow. That's right, yeah. And they released this album. And the the key with the album is Spotify was on and going, but you couldn't listen to it through streaming services. You had to buy the CD. Okay. So I got the CD as a gift, and I'm listening to the CD, and it really resonated during this really dark time because the album was an album he wrote about the separation with his wife. The crazy part is during the interview, he goes quiet after one of the questions, and you can tell that it's really bothering him to mm-hmm. give this answer, and he's really trying to process it in a, a way that's not going to reveal too much of his personal emotions, because he also noted that was the problem with his relationship, right. is he couldn't acknowledge things in a right. way that he was being true to himself. Right. So then he says, there's this Japanese art form called Kintsukuroi, and he says, how lucky am I that when I'm broken, I have the platform to be able to talk to all these people and to be able to help other people who are broken. There are wow. people who have been broken who don't have the chance to talk to anyone right. at all. And he's like, I'm worried about those people. That is beautiful. And I don't know why. <laughs> Since then, it just seemed like if I were to do something, right. it's better for it to exist within the public domain mm-hmm. and to be something free and accessible for people who just want to listen to yeah, that's people awesome. who could have been broken, you know? Yeah, well, they couldn't have couldn't have come up with a better host. So I know you, you self-invented yourself. <laughs> I appreciate yeah, it. I yeah. just appreciate people like you being willing to share something that's difficult, mm-hmm. you know, about your life mm-hmm. with a platform like yeah. this. So again, thanks, Mike. Yeah.